you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me. Lord, as we begin this day of celebration, Jesus' victory over death, we pray that you be near to us and continue to guide us until we join in the unending celebration in heaven. Amen. And again, Happy Easter. Very good. I want to read some scripture from the book of Mark this morning, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white and white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those words from the book of Mark this morning. There's a story about a doctor in Arkansas who misdiagnosed a patient. He declared the woman to be dead. The family was informed and the husband was grief-stricken. Imagine the surprise of the nurse when she discovered that the woman was not dead at all, but she was alive. And she urged the doctor, she said, you better call and tell the family, you have to do that. So the embarrassed physician phoned the husband and said, I need to talk to you about the condition of your wife. And the husband said, the condition of my wife, she's dead. The doctor said, well, she's seen a slight improvement. A slight improvement. Talk about an understatement. The truth of the matter is that once a person has been declared dead, if they revive, they really weren't dead at all. There was instead a tragic mistake made. When a person dies, they really die. That's it, finito. Of course, there is one notable exception. One notable exception. That exception took place at the tomb outside of Jerusalem. The, account, the accounts differ uh, from in the Gospels because they were eyewitness accounts and people see things differently. But the same thing happened. It's the first day of the week, you see. The Sabbath has passed. Three women are there, according to Mark's account. There's Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. They have brought spices that they might anoint the body of their close friend and a man who had been crucified on the preceding Friday on the cross at Calvary. Now, two days have passed, but their hearts are still very heavy with grief. And as they come closer to the tomb, they wonder, well, who's, who's going to roll this stone away? The stone that sealed the tomb was extremely large and heavy and would not give away easily. But to their amazement, the stone was already rolled away. And they entered the tomb gingerly, and they discovered a young man all dressed in white sitting there. And they were frightened. They were terrified. They were scared. The young man said, don't be afraid. You seek Jesus, the Nazarene which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. 
go tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he has said unto you. Now, the significance of the words and Peter in that verse is that they encapsulate the gospel of forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins, which we all commit. God has seen Peter's broken heart, and he's seen Peter's tears because of his denial of Jesus. And God received him in grace. His sin was forgiven. God comforted and encouraged Peter in the sorrow over his sin. Thus he said, the disciples and Peter. This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, who wrote hundreds of years before, he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. Isaiah 25 verse 8. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That's the one essential message of Easter Sunday. That's the word you've come here this morning to hear. That death has been defeated. That Christ is alive. The final enemy has been conquered. The message of Jesus' victory over the death probably doesn't have the same emotional uh, impact on us that it did on our fathers and mothers or our grandmothers and grandfathers. Death was a very near companion to people in past generations. The average lifespan was very short. Fatal diseases were often turned into epidemics. It just ran rampant. Many, if not most, families would lose at least one child while still in infancy. People died at home, not hidden away in hospitals. Death was very real, much more real than it is for us. Today our experts are both not denying and delaying our mortality. Children born this year will probably have a life expectancy of over 100 years. 100 years may be a conservative estimate. We are delaying dying. Now, if we could just solve the problem of aging. You might have heard about the guy who was arrested for selling eternal youth pills to people. And he promised his customers that they would never grow old. When he was booked at the police station, they checked his record and found that he had been arrested on the same charge in 1776, 1812, and 1903. In a self-indulgent culture such as ours, and we do live in a self-indulgent culture, many people fear aging more than they fear death. And yet science is rapidly placing on us the intolerable burden of Tithonus. You remember Tithonus in Greek mythology? Anybody read Greek mythology? Tithonus? Well, I'll, I'll refresh your memory. Aurora, the goddess of dawn, fell in love with Tithonus, who was a mortal youth. In other words, he would die like all other humans. Zeus, the king of gods, offered Aurora any gift she might choose for Tithonus. Well, naturally, she chose that he might live forever, but she forgot to ask that he would be forever young. And so Tithonus grew older and older and older and could never die, and the gift became a curse. So there may be many things in life we fear more than physical death. For many of us, death is something far removed from our daily lives. It has no real reality unless and until we are confronted with it personally or until someone we love dies. 
So we may not think about death in the same way that our ancestors did. Still, there is something about Easter that, that makes our hearts beat just a little bit faster. Maybe it's because Easter represents hope, a hope not only for us as we deal with death, but also as we deal with our everyday living. Because Jesus lives, we can live. What great good news that is today, Easter Sunday, 2024. Easter is a tonic for the soul. It helps us lift our eyes from our problems to our possibilities. Let me say it again. It helps us to lift our eyes from our problems to our possibilities. Jerome K. Jerome was an English writer and humorist. He lived from 1859 to 1927. And he said, look up, don't look down. When you look down, you see so much of yourself and so little of the other things that God made. Think about it. Don't look down. What do you see? Well, this is what I see right here. It ain't much. You look up and you see everything. For instance... He wrote one time that he had a finger that ached. It ached in the joint. He decided that he had arthritis. And so he went over to the public library and got a medical book out and looked up arthritis. And by the time he got through reading two pages on arthritis, he had arthritis in every joint in his fingers and in his toes besides. And he got, it scared him to death, and so he, he turned a few pages, and he found leukemia. And he read everything about leukemia, and before he finished, he knew he had leukemia. And then he turned the page to ulcers. And he said, so now I know what caused those pains in my stomach. I got ulcers. And he said, I turned the page to pellagra. You know what pellagra is? A deficiency of vitamin B. Three, and he said, I just knew I had pellagra. The only thing I found in the medical book that I didn't have was housemaid's knees. And I wondered why I didn't have that. So I went straight to the doctor who had examined me many times and had always told me that there was nothing wrong with me. There was nothing wrong. And he said, when I got there, I told him about all the things that I have and I had that I had, and the doctor sat there for a long time, didn't say anything. And then he said, yep, <clears throat> you're in a bad way. You really are. You are in a bad way. Now that you've diagnosed your case so well, I'm going to give you a prescription. Now, I've never given you any medicine up to this point, but this time I'm going to give you a prescription. And I want you to take it to the drugstore and get it filled. And so he wrote out this prescription, he folded it up, and he handed it to him. And the guy took off with it, went to the drugstore, and gave it to the pharmacist. The pharmacist opened it up and looked at it and kind of frowned a little bit, and he scratched his head, and he folded it back up, and he says, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't have anything in my drugstore like this. And the guy said, what? Aren't you the biggest drugstore in this part of the city? He said, yes, we are. But the things that the doctor has prescribed for you don't come in a bottle. He folded the prescription back up and handed it to him. And he said, you take it and read it for yourself. He said, I opened it up and this is what it said. Walk six miles a day. Eat a steak for supper. And stop reading things you've got no business reading. It's a dangerous thing to look down at yourself. Think about it. You look down at yourself. That's all you got. You get the feeling very sorry for yourself. Isn't that part of the joy of Easter, though? Think about it. It helps us lift our eyes from our problems to our possibilities. Amen? 
Look up. Don't look down. Because he lives. I can live. Because he lives, you can live. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is alive today? Yes? All hands up? You see, life is not always roses and sunshine. There are also thorns and thunderclouds. It happens. Easter is God's promise to us that neither life nor death can conquer us. Easter is hope. Easter is an affirmation of God's goodness and His grace, His favor to us. Easter is also an affirmation of Christ's presence in our lives today. He's here with us. It's so good to know that Christ does live. We share in the joy of Mary Magdalene and Peter and all those disciples and devoted followers that Jesus appeared to when death could no longer hold him. Because you see, he lives in our hearts as well. He lives in each one of our hearts today. Everybody raised their hands just a minute ago. Christ lives. And that, my friends, is what the meaning of Easter is. Death has been conquered. Amen? We can lift our eyes from our problems to our possibilities. Jesus is alive, and because he lives, we also can live. No wonder Easter is so special. It's not a denial of the power of death, but it's a fantastic victorious affirmation of life and of God. Christ lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. I have to tell you this. There was a student in a Catholic seminary, young man, first year. And one day the dean told him, you prepare to preach tomorrow in this class. He had never preached one time in his life. He went home that night and he worked on, he just got books out and he looked and he looked and he couldn't find anything to, to, that he could speak on or preach on. Stayed up all night, nothing, nothing came to him. The next day in class, he was called to the pulpit and he looked out at his fellow um, seminary students, and he said to them, do you know what I'm going to say? And they said, no. And he said, neither do I. The service is over. Go in peace. The dean wasn't happy. And he went up to him and he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Tomorrow, you be prepared to preach. The kid goes home at night, same thing. He worked and he looked and he looked and he couldn't find, stayed up all night, couldn't find anything. Went to class the next day. It was time for him to preach. He looked at his fellow students. He said, you know what I'm going to say? And they all nodded their head, yeah. And he said, well, then there's no reason for me to say anything. Go in peace. The service is over. The dean was really angry now. He was absolutely livid. He said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Tomorrow, you be prepared to preach. Same thing, same scenario. He goes home, can't come up with anything. Can't come up with anything. Goes the next day, and gets up in the pulpit, looks at the, his friends and he said, do you know what I'm going to say? Half of them said yes. Half of them said no. The student preacher said, those who know, tell those who don't. The service is over, go in peace. The dean came up to him, put his arm around him and said, those who know, tell those who don't. Today, the gospel has been proclaimed. Amen? That's what we need to do as Christians. We can't bottle this up. We can't keep it to ourselves. 
He's not hanging on a cross anymore. He's alive. He went to be with God the Father. And he's coming back for us. Amen? Amen. Come on, don't sit there just thinking about it. We need to spread the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. It's up to us. You and me. We have this gift inside us. We can't keep it to ourselves. Let today the gospel be proclaimed through us. Amen? Pray with me. Lord God, we're just so fortunate that we know this truth. But Lord, you need to push us out the door so that we can, can witness to people that Jesus is alive. He's not only alive in our lives, he's alive everywhere. But it will take people like us to spread this gospel. Be with us, Lord, in our endeavor. Until we meet again. Amen.